Hey. Hi. How y'all doing? Doing how good. You, how you doing? Blessed and highly favored. Ain't no use in complaining. I got you. Amen. Yes. That was a that was a good lesson this week. Well, I pray that um God bring forth so we can enjoy it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna I'm, I'm going to go and finish putting my clothes on. All right, all right, all right. but I'll, I'll I'm I'm within hearing I'm I'm within hearing distance. Okay. Hi, Roz. Good morning. How you doing? Good. Look, when um uh the nominating committee, I put your um, name back in as our um representative for finance. We're live on Facebook. We're on Facebook, yeah. Okay. Let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Kingdom Praise and Fellowship Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson. Today is April the 28th, and our lesson is entitled, Faith of a Canaanite. Um, let's take a moment with a word of prayer. Father God, we come to you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just thank you, Father, for your many blessings, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Father, for waking us up this morning. Allow us to see another day, Father God. Lord, we just thank you, Father God, to give us ability just to hear and, see, and speak on your word, Lord. We ask you, Lord, that you would just... Decrease me, Father God. I need you to magnify yourself, Father God, that you will give us the lessons that you want us to receive from this um, information, Lord. Father God, we ask you to present it. We ask you, Lord, that you will touch our ears and our hearts so we may hear it and receive it, Father God. And more importantly, Lord, to not let it go to waste, Father God, but to be doers of your word, Father God, and to be an example as you are, Father, and to have great faith just like this woman. Lord, I present this to you, Father God, that you will help us, you will speak through me, Father God, and that you will touch some lives, Father God. And Lord, we just present all things to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to try not to be before you long, but I do want to um, pray that God will reveal the lessons that he wants us to have. Um, we're still dealing with the spring quarter, which is examining our faith. We're in unit two which is called the measure of faith. And all month long, we've been dealing with examples of how people use their faith to receive healings and blessings from the Lord or to um, show how much gratitude they have for God for what he did. Our devotional reading today comes from Psalm 61 and the background scripture as well as the lesson comes from Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. Our key verse for today's lesson is Matthew chapter 15, verse 28. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Now, for the lesson, it wants us to summarize um, the interaction between Jesus and the Canaanite woman. These are our, our, our aims. Explain Jesus' response in verse 24 and think about situations where parents should or should not intervene on behalf of a child. Um, we may touch a little bit on that, but you'll see how this woman intervened on behalf of her child. So as we read through the lesson, just think about yourself. Now, this woman was an outsider. Think about how you would feel in this particular situation and see how I can bless you as well as others. As a little bit um, history, <clears throat> the gospel Matthew um, doesn't really identify who his author is, but it's a tribute to, the ownership is a tribute to Matthew who was a tax collector. And I think we touched on that last week, who also became one of the apostles. Other gospels mention his him by his birth name, which is Levi, because he was named after one of the sons of Jacob. Um, as a tax collector, 
Matthew worked with foreign occupiers of Philistines, um, which was the Romans. And during the first century AD, tax collectors, as I mentioned last week, they were despised because they took on the role of collecting taxes from the Jews. And not only did they collect taxes, um, unfortunately, they also padded their own pockets by charging more than what was really due. And as a result, they weren't very popular people. Now, Matthew wrote the gospel to his fellow Jews. He wanted to prove that Jesus was the Messiah, and he also wanted to explain that of God's kingdom. Now, other information um, we have about this apostle is that he's the son of Alphaeus, and the, God, the apostle James was also called the son of Alphaeus, but we don't know whether these two were brothers because it's not mentioned in the gospel. Okay. Matthew gospel is also one of um, the synoptic gospels. You know, we got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they all tell the same situation, but sometimes they add a little bit more or take a little bit less. They clarify things based on their viewpoints about what took place during that time period. And when you put them all together, you get a clear, a clear picture of what took place during that period. Matthew Gospel also contain most of the quotations from the Old Testament. So it's showing the reverence of the Old Testament in the Gospel. Matthew itself uses about 65 Old Testament quotes in this book. Mark about 30, Luke 26, and John 16. Most people call Matthew the most Jewish of the four Gospels. Um, as I mentioned to you before, it was written primarily for the Jewish audience. This message reveals that the Gospel of Jesus Christ and it not only appeals to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. Matthew is the only gospel to record the visit of the Gentile mag magic. And um, it also includes the commission of the disciples that we're supposed to make disciples of all nations. And that's in Matthew 28, 16, 20. The events leading to today's scripture reveals the intended expansion of the gospel's message. As Jesus' ministry in Galilee drew to a close, it became evident that his people would reject him and his mission. His disciples displayed little faith regarding his identity. They are, they are just as bad as we are, but growing. They also failed to understand his teaching. Even the religious leaders were offended by Jesus' message. People most expected to accept Jesus and his mission failed to understand it. So another thing we need to know that the uh, parallel to Mark, Matthew 15 is Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 30. It gives a little, little bit more information. Now, just a little tidbit, what was going on prior to this woman approaching Jesus. Jesus, you know, was out. He was ministering to the people. And during this time period, there was a little confrontation with the uh, Pharisees. The Pharisees was upset because the disciples were eaten with unclean hands. Um, keep in mind what the law of Moses is. The law of Moses didn't really talk about hand washings and the traditions and all that stuff. But the Pharisees added a whole lot to, um, to the law. Whereas they had this ritual, whereas when you went into the marketplace, you had to wash hands before you ate. And it wasn't not just you go in there and wash your hands. It was a whole ritual that they had to follow to wash their hands, a, a real ceremony. Um, and they were upset about, A, disciples eating with unclean hands, and then who they fellowship with and what they ate. Not really the message of Jesus Christ, but they were looking at outward stuff. And God was telling them, you know, you look at outward stuff, but you know what? When you talk about cleanliness, you need to look at the heart because that's what is really important. What comes out your heart and those nitpicky things, those gossip things, the evilness, the strife, those are the things that make you unclean after washing up your hands. So that was part of the confrontation. So now Jesus moved on because, hey, at this time, 
you know, he's been ministering to the people. He's been dealing with the Philistines, I mean, the Pharisees and the scribes. He needs a break. So he walks, he goes on to withdraw from the borders of Israel. And it says he moved northwest between to the Gentile territory in the directions of the um, um, Tyre and Sidon, which are um, Phoenician cities. And he withdrew because, you know, God has to get some rest sometimes too. And he likes to go in solitude and pray. And that was his attention at that time. Before we go on, let's talk a little bit about Tyree and Sidon. These were two prominent cities during that time period, and it was on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, north of Galilee. And it's part of the region, today's region, what we call Lebanon. Now, if you remember, these were cities where that was designated for the tribe of Asher. They were supposed to go in, clean out all the inhabitants, but they didn't do so. As a result, you still had some Canaanite people that lived in that area. Now, Tyree and Sidon was really prosperous areas. They were, Tyree was about 125 miles from north of um, Jerusalem. Sidon was an additional 25 miles. But these cities are mentioned in the Bible several times, at least 30 times in the Bible. Basically because of their access to the maritime trade. They attained great wealth during that time period. Now, Tyree also became popular because not only did it flourish, but they also had some issues there. It was ran by what you call a prideful leader, one that acted unjustly. In fact, he claimed that he was God himself. And if you go to Isaiah 20, chapter 28, verse 1, it talks about how he claimed that he was God himself. He was, it was a wicked city. They also were happy when Jerusalem was destroyed in 586 BC because with Jerusalem gone, it took away Israel's competition, which made their profits even a little bit more greater. So this was an evil and materialistic culture. And Jesus was bringing a message to them during this time period. He also mentioned these cities in his indictment of the Jews um, when he talked about um, Horea, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. Um, his contrast to the Gentile cities was a lesser because you had more Gentile people that believed in Jesus than the Jews. And he felt like he went to the Jews first for them to repent of their sins. And if they repented of their sins and accepted their faith as the Gentiles did, then they will be flourishing more and they will be able to do some things for the kingdom as well. But, you know, the Gentiles accepted him more than some of the Jewish people did. Verse 22. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out. Now, the crowds have followed Jesus. Yeah, he had planned on being there. He had planned on being, um, getting some rest. He didn't want anybody to know that he was present. But don't you know when somebody do something great for you and they know that you can help them out, it's going to be difficult to go someplace and be solid. So the crowd followed him. And undoubtedly, this woman knew who he was as well. She came and followed him too. Now, Matthew describes her as a Canaanite, but Mark is more specific. He knows that she was a Greek. She was born a Cyrenian Phoenician. Phoenician. Um, and remember what I said before, the Canaanites were enemies to, to um, Israel during that time period. Mark Gospel also provides other details that's not given in Matthew. Mark states that Jesus entered a house now, this house, we know what did not belong to the woman. The gospel unveils that Jesus had intended for his presence, as I mentioned to you before, to be secret. But yet this woman came in to appeal to God. And she said, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. 
Now, this woman acknowledged Jesus as the son of David. That's something that the Pharisees didn't even do. And she cries out for mercy. Now, when she's crying out, she's, I believe that she's yelling so that she can get God's attention. And she's asking for help for her daughter. She's desperate. Jesus, whom she called Lord and son of David, which is the main theme of the story. It just shows that she has faith. She's recognizing him as the Messiah, where the Philistines and the scribes didn't even recognize him as the Messiah. Lord, have mercy on me, the woman cries out. She's crying for her daughter because the daughter is suffering from demon possession. Now, neither Matthew nor Mark describes the symptoms that the daughter was going through. But if we go back and look at other scriptures in Matthew, it talks about how demon-possessed people experience physical disorders. Um, they have these evil spirits. Oftentimes, they are mute or blind. They may destruct destructive things to themselves or others. So this is a serious situation. Even if you're dealing with an evil spirit, you know how you're dealing with some people and one minute they're nice and next minute they may be evil. Sometimes that can be difficult to handle. But this woman appeals to God and she makes a request. She wants God to heal her daughter, freeing her daughter of demon possession. But not only that, she also asks for mercy for herself. Because when you're dealing with someone who's ill, you know, that can be very trying. So this woman being the primary gear caregiver taker to her daughter is going through some, some trauma too. And she needs some help as well. So that's a good point. That's something that we need to also look at. Verse 23, Jesus did not answer a word. And Jesus' refusal to answer the woman might seem kind of cruel, but keep in mind the culture during that time period. The culture during that time period, it would have been inappropriate for a Jewish rabbi to answer a woman, especially a Canaanite woman, a Gentile. Not only did that silence was reverence in that day because they didn't talk, but he also could have been testing the woman, just testing her strength, and the quality of her faith. Because during that time period, the teachers also would test their students. And then this, this was no exception. The strategic silence could have created space for the woman to continue talking and explaining what her desires were. So in 23, continuing in verse 23, his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for well, she's crying after us. Now, the disciples apparently takes Jesus' silence as a way of rebuffing the woman's request. So they urge him to send her away. And because they're saying she's crying after us. Keep in mind, the disciples didn't have any power to change anything. She was really crying after Jesus. But even in that state, when they said send her away, we just assumed that, that she might be a nuisance. But we really don't know what their motives was. We just know they're saying send her away. They could say send her away and give her what she want. But even in this transaction, this communication, I can say that the disciples didn't really show any compassion for this woman. They weren't sensitive to her needs. Um, they were thinking more so of other spiritual matters. And I want to pause right there because I want to make sure that we understand that we shouldn't be like these disciples. You know, when people are going through different stresses in their lives, we shouldn't just ignore them, even though we're supposed to be spiritual and we're thinking about, you know, so we're serving God and we're doing this. They actually missed the opportunity to minister to her. I want us to make sure that we don't let our biases interfere with how we communicate to people and that we don't miss an opportunity to serve someone else in their time of trouble. Verse 24, he answered, 
I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now, perhaps these disciples remember Jesus' charge that included direction not going to the Gentiles, but to the lost sheep of Israel. The lost sheep of Israel doesn't mean um, people who may be in Israel who's lost and where others aren't. The expression really indicates the house of Israel. So he's there for the Jews first. That's his primary mission. But also keep in mind that the lost sheep is lost without a shepherd. So Jesus came as a shepherd for the people. He was there to provide spiritual care and guidance like a shepherd, caring for the sheep. Central to Jesus' mission as a shepherd was his preaching on the need for repentance and the presence of God's kingdom. The mission was to reveal the word to the Israels first, to the Jews first. Give them, them their blessings first. Then they'll be able to bless others. And then the word will go to the Gentiles. So I want to make sure we're clear on this. Matthew Gospel is not conveying an anti-Gentile sentiment. Because the Old Testament prophets proclaimed that the Messiah's mission would include the Gentiles. And we'll see that in Hosea chapter 2, verses 23, Zedekiah chapter 14, verses 16. With few exceptions, Jesus' earthly ministry focused on the people of Israel first. And he acknowledged, however, that the mission will reach the Gentiles. Hey, and that's how it reached us. Matthew 24, 14, Matthew 28 tells them to go throughout the nations and preach the word of God. And let's look at verse 25. The woman came. You know, she made her appeal first time, okay, to God. But now she came and she kneeled before God and she said, Lord, help me. At this point, it's apparent that the woman is facing three obstacles. First, she had the silence of Jesus. Then the annoyance of Jesus' followers and the definition of the mission of Jesus to appeal to the lost sheep of Israel, the lost sheep the house of Israel's first. That lost sheep didn't, at this time did not include her nor her daughter. Now, under most circumstances, people probably would give up. They'd probably be disgusted. They'd probably be dismayed. You know, they would just give up. But not this woman. This woman had great faith. She was not dissuaded. Despite the rejections that she was feeling, she responded to Jesus in reverence and worship. The woman worship of Jesus further develops a theme of her great faith and set up the second exchange in which she repeats her plea for help. Now, verse 26 tells us, she replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the doves. Wow, that sounds like an insult, right? But also we need to keep in mind what was the, the language during that time period. The children was Israel, the children of Israel. So the word again was supposed to go to them first. But the doves, you know, although the, if you talk to um, a Pharisee, they may have looked at the word dove, because that's what they call the Gentiles, as a mutt in the street. But that's not what God meant here. He meant, when he was talking about the dogs, he was talking about the house dog, the pet dog. And most of us who have dogs in the house, they pretty much a part of the family. You treat them different. You don't treat them like you would see a mutt on the street, but you also would take care of them. And I believe this is his intent that he meant when he was talking about the Gentiles here. He weren't talking about the mutt on the street, but he was referring to it as a pet, a house dog. Um, during that time period. So we, we need to be clear that he wasn't talking down to her, even though it may look like that. I love her response. Verse 27, she comes back and she said, yes, it is Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that falls from the master table. Now, if you have a pet in the house, you know, a lot of times, um, like our dog, she was sitting in the family room and watch us eat in the kitchen. But if something drop on the floor, oh, she's gonna to try to come clean it up for us. 
you don't have to sweep the floor because they're looking for the crumbs because the crumbs is still part of what you're eating. It may not be the big portion, but it's like a little overflow that you can still taste and feel and receive the same thing that the person at the table did. So the Gentile woman accepted that Jesus was sent to Israel, but she did not accept that he was exclusively sent to Israel. And she did not take Jesus no. Instead, she built on what he said. And she said, she pointed out that Doug's did not have to take the food from the children in order to receive a blessing from the crumbs. How strong is your faith? Then verse 28, Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Now this woman understood the program that Jesus had to go to Israel first, but she persisted. In a sense, Jesus may have been testing her. He wasn't trying to destroy her faith, but he actually developed her faith. Her own replies show that she was growing in faith. And she used it. She was unwilling to accept the answer of no. Now, you know, when you're going through some things for your family, especially for your children, you're not listening for a no. You're going to bombard God. If you believe in God, you're going to bombard him with prayers. If you're seeking the Lord for your loved one, every opportunity that you get, you're going to pray. I remember when some of my family members were going through various things. I prayed going to sleep. And when I woke up, I'm still praying. If I wake up in the middle of the night, I'm praying. Because you want the Lord to intercede on the behalf of that individual. And you're going to do whatever you need to do that for him to hear that prayer and ask him, to intervene, to save that person, to heal that person. And fortunately, God has interceded on many times for us. Verse 28b, your request is granted. And the scripture said, and her daughter was healed at that moment. Now, this also parallels with some of the stories of Jesus healing that we covered earlier during the month with the Roman centurion servant, in Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 to 13, and in this instance as well. These people were sick. They went before God, as with the paralyzed man where the friends lowered him in the ceiling. These people were a distance away. Yet God spoke a word, and they were ill, they were healed instantly. Just to let us know, all God has to do is speak the word. And we can receive our healing. These are examples that God shows and gives to us in scripture. In conclusion, the woman in today's text, she may have been an outsider to a first century Jewish audience. She was aware of the biases against her as she approached Jesus, who was a Jewish teacher. To begin with, her nationality was against her because she was a Gentile and Jesus was a Jew. And besides that, she was a woman and society in that time didn't really talk to women. It was a society that was dominated by men. Satan was against her because his demons were controlling her daughter which hindered not only her daughter's life, but as well as her life. The disciples were against her as well because they were saying, Lord, send her away. And Jesus was just there just trying to get some rest. And he wasn't responding initially the way she wanted him to respond. But even though it looked as if Jesus was against her and it wasn't an easy situation, her faith triumphed. She did not give up. She pursued God until he heard her and granted her desires. So despite the awareness that she went through, her desperate situation, her suffering daughter, the necessity for a bold response, the necessity to be persistent and to have faith. And as a result, she received mercy from the son of David. Great faith 
is faith that takes God at his word and will not let it go until God meets the need. I'm going to say that one more time. Great faith is faith that takes God at his word and will not let go until God meets the need. Great faith can lay hold even when we feel discouraged or when there's just a little encouragement around. But it can be fulfilled, fulfilled promise. All we have to do is trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to his word, fellowship him, worship him, and allow our faith to increase. And this scripture tells us today and invites us to desire a life of great faith. A life of great faith requires a steadfast confidence that God would show mercy to anyone, to the Jews or the Gentiles. Now I have a question for you. Is there a blessing that you failed to receive because you had limited or misplaced faith? Or, and another question, how strong is your faith? What would you do if your child was in desperate need? How would you act? Let's get in the word. Let's study the word. Let's get to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Not just a book knowledge, but relationship. And present all of our cares to him. That's the conclusion of my lesson. Are there any questions, comments, concerns? I hope I touched on everything that y'all needed. Hope I explained the scripture well. It was a very good lesson. Praise God. You know you did a good job because the Holy Spirit led you. Praise God. Gave you the message. He did. Um, it's just that um, when we had the lesson last night, um, I think I told the student, no matter what, we've got to remember that God's love can override anything that separates us from him. He can override anything. So um, you did a wonderful job with the lesson. It's so what has to happen, we got to get on our job by purging and cleansing our hearts so that we may be able to walk upright with God. Um, the, the lessons that come forth each Sunday, we do fine. But do we as a people, do we individually address Jesus as the son of David? Mm -hmm. The point. Is he the son of David in your heart? So these are the things that we have to ponder. And you brought them out clearly. I mean, if you didn't understand today's lesson, you got to go, go back and ask God to, to um, show you some things. Mm -hmm. Because even though the teacher, God gave the teacher the message, but you have to have a prepared heart to receive the message. Amen. Again, it was a wonderful lesson, and I got a lot out of the lesson. And I'm going to close with that. Praise God. Thanks, Dr. Clarice. Is there another? Yes. Good morning. Good lesson. Um, it makes it makes me think about you know um, my faith and my journey. Um, we have to remember that God is not limited in what He can do or what He can give. And um, it's often our, our our lack of faith that limit what we can receive. Amen. We have to, um, you know, continue to press on and um, increase our knowledge mm -hmm. and um, our understanding of, of God and what he can do. And we have to do this over time. You know, um, I don't care how long you've been, you know, saved or a Christian, you still have to continue to grow. We have to continue to read our Bible. Correct. Um, you know, um, pray, like you say, pray. We have to meditate. 
and um you know participate in different things like weekly bible study bible you know um sunday school and scriptures and things like that so a great lesson um it definitely spoke to me and i i know i still have room to grow and i just thank god for um um for your um delivery of today's message that's good we all have space to grow because you know if you don't stay in the word you will get discouraged. Your faith will decrease. You got to stay in the word to build up that faith, to stay encouraged and study the word because the meaning behind it, sometimes we overlook stuff and it's a deeper, richer meaning that will help us through our storms. So we really need to stay in the word. Absolutely. And sometimes, you know, when you pray and ask God for things and it doesn't happen right away, I heard you say limited or misplaced faith, but you know, sometimes God, I mean, I, I say God doesn't, you know, um, give us certain things because he wants us to um, have a better understanding and continue to grow. You right. know, and I feel and, like, mm -hmm. no, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and once we reach that point, you know, then showers of blessings, you know, <laughs> so, we can so, take oh, increments, you know, because right. if we did everything at one time, you know, we'll feel like, you know, hey, we did it or we deserve, you know, but no, God humbles us in so many ways. Does. And then keep also keep in mind, sometimes we ask for things that we're really not ready to handle. Yep. So he has to wait until we get there to yes. give us some things. Yes. And then some things he said, you no, know, you don't need that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So true. You just got to trust God. And just keep in mind, he knows what's best for us. Yes. yes. I'm just glad some of the things I asked for, I didn't get. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, next week's lesson is called Justified by Faith. The devotional reading comes from John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8 and 13 to 17. Background scriptures come from Roman chapter 3, verses 21 to 30. And ladies, who's teaching next week's lesson? I think it's me this time. Okay. So Deaconess Rosalind Walker will be teaching next week. Okay. And if there's nothing else, we'll have Pastor Eccles close out prayer. Great lesson. <clears throat> Thank God for the examples of faith in the Bible. Encourage our faith. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for the encouragement today, no matter what obstacles, even when it seems like you're turning us away, we just keep on believing you and we trust in you, God, for the things you have for our lives. More than that, God, we just want to come to know you. We want to know your heart. We want to know your mind. We want to know your will. We want to know your direction for our lives. So give us light. Give us enlightenment. Not only help us to study the word, but give us understanding of your ways. And we're so grateful for this opportunity, dear God, for this Sunday school ministry. May you use it. These churches that gather together, may you use this Sunday school um, platform to help people to grow in Christ. Thank you for these things. May all thanks to you. Remember our brother Deacon Joe, that you continue to comfort his family, oh God, that you would continue to touch my brother-in-law, Deacon JJ, to continue to body and his family. And we thank you for all your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Walk with the king. Go ahead. And be all that Walk God. Walk with the king and be all that God wants you to be. God all bless right. you. Amen. Have a blessed day and a blessed week, everyone.